Welcome to this New Thinking for a New World podcast of the Talbert Foundation. Does the COVID-19 epidemic provide a unique opportunity to address climate change? Can the nearly unprecedented mobilization of political will, state authority, financial resources and individual behavioral change to address the corona crisis also be channeled to create a more resilient and safer economy for the future? Who will provide that leadership and what can individuals like you and I do? Alan Stoga, the chairman of the Talberg Foundation, discussed these and other questions with Christiana Figueres, a founding partner at Global Optimism and who in her previous position as Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was instrumental in negotiating the Paris Climate Accords. Christiana is also a Talberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize Laureate. Christiana, we're talking at a unique moment. For the first time in 75 years, the whole world is focused on the same problem. In the process, mobilizing unprecedented political will, state authority, and fiscal resources. Even more amazing, most leaders are insisting that action should be science and evidence-based. How do we transfer all of that energy to addressing the even larger, more deadly challenge of climate change? Well, this is exactly the question, Alan. I'm sure that there is no one simple answer. But as you have pointed out, the ingredients that we need to respond to climate in a timely fashion are the same ingredients that we're already exercising and putting into practice to respond to to the COVID crisis. So as you pointed out, political will, Uh, is there, at least in most countries. State authority and state finances, a much, much bigger role for government that has uh, been called for and frankly has been relatively unquestioned, which is highly unusual, right? Because we have been for quite a few years in a questioning mode about what is the role and in particular, what are the boundaries of state authority and state role. Uh, And yet when it comes to uh, deciding on very, very clear measures to protect human life, and especially when it comes to who's going to put the capital necessary to recover the economy, capital which will have to be in several trillion dollars level, well then obviously the answer is the state, the government. And all of this actually is being led by science, in this case, by health science and health officials that uh, have been catapulted into, um, in, into positions of very high authority in many countries. Here in my little Costa Rica, it's the health minister that is uh, calling all the shots. And the, the cabinet meetings that are occurring every few days are revolving around the recommendations of the health minister, frankly, as it should be right now, right? Um, and on science, it would be the same thing. We would have to base our decisions and our responses on science. So as I said, all of the all of the um, components of the response to COVID crisis are the same components that we would have to harness to respond to climate. The, so, so we know that we can do it, right? To all of those who said, well, we don't have the capital or the state doesn't have the authority or you know, the science is not clear enough or whatever. All of that can now be wiped off the table because we know we can do all of this. And the one piece actually, Alan, that you didn't mention that we would have to add as a necessary component is individual behavioral changes. We individuals can change our behavior very quickly. So the question now is, How do we harness all of this for climate, in particular given the challenge that because governments are going to be making such a huge capital injection into the economy to revive it and it's going to be necessary, those trillions that some authorities think could go even up to 10 trillion, those trillions of dollars will not be readily available again over the next let me say 10 years. And therefore, this capital injection that will go into recovering the economy will define the shape of the economy 
for those 10 years. And it so happens that those are the 10 years that according to climate science, we actually have to um, reach one half of current greenhouse gas emissions. So those who speak about horizons would say that the COVID horizon has converged upon the climate horizon. And the big question now is, what are the characteristics of the recovery packages going to be? If those recovery packages are carbon intensive and go to those industries that are most carbon intensive, we actually stand very little chance, if any at all, of responding to climate in a timely way. If, on the contrary, those recovery packages keep the bigger crisis of climate in mind and inject the capital, certainly, because it needs to be injected, but inject the capital in order to guide the economy toward lower carbon, we actually could emerge from this crisis having not only vanquished the health crisis, but having stepped forward in a very impressive way on climate. But that requires politics as usual, which is happening everywhere, to become a casualty of the pandemic. The normal response in cycle after cycle after cycle is to throw money at the status quo and not to try to shape the status quo into a, into a new, in this case, uh, net zero retrofitted economy. It, it is a unique opportunity. How do you break the back of politics as usual? Yeah. Well, if that's an invitation to write a letter to Santa Claus, what would I like to see happen? Um, that's a pretty easy answer. The more difficult question and the more difficult answer is what is going to happen. But uh, what I would like to see happen is obviously uh, a multilateral effort that would uh, stem out of collaboration. And the big question is, is all of that going to happen behind closed national borders? Is every country going to fend for itself? That I think would be a waste of resources and, uh, and would not optimize the efforts that could come from a collaborative process. But it is possible that every country will fend for itself. At least that is what we have been seeing up until now. The opposite would be a much better response, certainly for the health crisis, and as a prelude to what needs to be done on the recovery packages. Because once you figure out that, um, that you're better off collaborating with each other and that you're better off having a longer-term vision rather than a short-term vision, then you can optimize the economy for carbon as well. But it does require, Alan, it does require different thinking and different acting than what we're seeing right now. Will we get there? I don't know. Is it possible, or is this Santa Claus time, that the response has been so scattershot, has been so national, has been so border intensive, and frankly, not very successful, that out of this mess, the phoenix of collaboration could in fact rise again? What would it take? Where does the leadership come from? Who is going to stand up and say, hey, there is a better way to do this. And indeed, there's an essential way to do this. Um, that's where all that, that is the altar in front of which all of my little candles are lit because uh, one always hopes, and in this case, it is particularly true that once you hit rock, rock bottom, which I think we're hitting uh, quickly, although I also know, it's not that I suspect, but I know that the COVID crisis is going to get much worse before it gets better because it has not even started to have the kind of impact uh, that it will in developing countries. But having said that, um, because we will hit such a rock bottom, I am, you know, lighting all of my candles for there to be uh, an enlightened moment in which we realize this is not something, a global crisis is indeed global dumb as that may seem, as that uh, that statement may seem, but we are in the middle of a global crisis. We have several other global crises that will be following on the heels. And is this not the time to turn toward optimization through collaboration? 
Um, how is that going to happen? Well, it doesn't seem that the United States, under current leadership, is any way inclined in this direction. Uh, I do think that the election in the United States is probably the most important political event as well as the most important economic event that we have seen certainly in years, if not in decades, because of the consequences of these decisions. Now, nobody knows what is going to happen in November. But there is, let's say, you know, not to take, uh, not, not, not to put any irresponsible numbers out there, there's a 50-50 chance that the United States, if President Trump is not reelected, and if we have what now seems to be um, Biden back in the White House sitting in a different chair, um, if that is the case, I do think that the United States will return to its international leadership that it has been known for of multilateral um, approaches to these kinds of issues. In the absence of that, who else would? Well, China, of course, has the potential to do so, but it's giving small signs of it. It is sending uh, support, medical support, to countries that are particularly hard hit. It is uh, trying to, to step into a role of, uh, of solidarity and of multilateral leadership. Would it go all the way to fill in the vacant shoes that the United States has actually emptied um, under a Trump administration? I'm not sure. Um, China has always said that um, that they will follow their own path, but they do not want to influence others. And that runs very, very deep in the Chinese psyche. So I'm not quite sure that they would actually step into those shoes. With which, and then everybody else, you know, Europe right now in a very, very difficult situation internally. So I think right now what we have is what Ian Bremmer calls the G0 world, right? The, the, the trust that I have in humanity that we do learn from lessons and that we do learn from our wounds and, um, and can heal and come out stronger. But I don't know how powerful my little candles are going to be, Alan. I actually think we need to call this a gee whiz world. <laughs> and I think we're going to need, if we're looking for leaders, to look for leaders beyond the usual suspects. Because as you just inventoried, the gee whizzes of the world are, are mostly AWOL. But you do have multilateral organizations, international organizations, corporates, uh, not-for-profits, NGOs, uh, people like you who are working about as hard as people can work to try to force different conversations, different actions, different leadership modes. My conclusion from all this is waiting for the G's is waiting for Godot, another G, by the way. Uh, so unless we look elsewhere, we're not going to find leadership. One of the things that you and Tom Rivet Karnick in your book, Future We Choose, talked a lot about is that if there's going to be action, it's going to be individuals that are going to both have to do the action, but also motivate others. You already mentioned that one of the characteristics of the COVID response has been exactly the same thing. It's up to the individual to social distance, to wash their hands, to take care of their own hygiene. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. What can individuals do to change the political realities that we're talking about that drive the climate realities? Yeah. So I, I do think that, uh, as has been shown by the health crisis, um, we need both top down and bottom up. Um, it, you know, the, the measures that have been um, imposed, mandated or recommended, depending on which country you look at, by the authorities would have absolutely no impact if individuals didn't choose to, uh, to change their behaviors and to abide by those recommendations. So, you know, the, uh, an excellent case study um, that proves that individuals are far from helpless. And in this case, in the absence of 
government leadership, obviously then the leadership that is there uh, is one for corporates to stand in to that uh, role of top-down uh, leadership. And I do think that one of the pretty predictable after effects of the COVID pandemic is that there is going to be a very, very high expectation on the part of the public and increasingly on the part of shareholders um, for corporations to uh, ad adopt a very sincere triple bottom line attitude and approach. So it's not just profits, it's both people, planet, and profits. The triple bottom line that has been written about forever uh, and which some countries have adopted, but not the majority. I do think that corporations will be seen as having not just to not cause a problem, but rather to step in actively into contributing to social solutions, to environmental solutions. So while I would love to say corporates can take the leadership uh, and can really help us to create the future that we want. Right now, under the very unexpected circumstances that we have, under the financial circumstances that we have, which were completely unpredictable, that we would have, that the states, that governments would have to go so deeply into debt to put trillions of dollars into the economy. None of us could have predicted this even two months ago. And the scale of that investment is such that it will mark the economy. So I find myself, Alan, frankly, in a conundrum. Because if, you know, if, if governments were putting in billions of dollars, okay, you know, the, the impact is relatively manageable, and then you can complement it with corporates and individuals, et cetera, et cetera. But these are trillions. My friends tell me up to 10 trillion. That is going to mark the economy. So where I come out of this is that it is now the responsibility of individuals and corporates to make it very clear to governments that those recovery packages have to have green strings attached. If they have forgotten that, if in the rush to meet the imminent threat that we're all ha that we're all facing right now, they have forgotten the long-term thinking, and they have forgotten that the curve of climate change is a much steeper curve, and the impacts are, you know, at least one or two orders of magnitude beyond everything that we're seeing right now. If they have, if they tend to forget that, I think it is the role of corporates and individuals over the next six months. I'm not talking about over the next ten years. Now, right now to remind governments that they have to both walk and chew gum at the same time. And they're capable of doing that, right? They have to both revive the economy in the short term and create the millions of jobs and stabilize uh, what, uh, what, what is now on a precipice, but also do it in service of a much more resilient, safer uh, economy for the future. What is amazing about the moment, as you've said, is that it could happen. It could happen, yes. That those policies are being written, those packages are being designed, those trillions, and I suspect your 10 is a small number, by the way. Uh, I suspect it's going to be much, much larger than that as you think about both the fiscal and the financial side of the house. Uh, True. This is, this is what people like Saul Griffith, one of the people that the Telberg Foundation honored last year, an engineer doing a lot of work in this space. He talked about the arsenal for democracy model back in the prior to World War II, when the United States completely shifted its productive capacity from peace to war and said, we got to do that again. And I said to him, I can't imagine what could get us to do that because we don't make those kinds of decisions except under stress. And as you said, we're in the middle of that stress. You could not have conjured this up uh, if you were a Shakespearean <laughs> uh, spirit to Correct. say, okay, here's your solution. Here you are. So I'm, I'm so frustrated, right? Because why not then 
take this moment of stress, as you call it, very important stress, and say, right, you know, you've already com- you've already committed to this. Here you are. Here's cash in hand. Go for it, right? Do the transformation that is necessary. Now, to your question of how are we going to do this, I, I think this needs, you know, like you're doing here, Alan, I think it needs a huge outcry from uh, from individuals who raise their voices via all the channels. There is just so much, so many channels out there of discussion right now. It just needs to fill the the waves. It needs corporates to put pressure on uh, on governments as well. We all need to 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 find our way in. Um, to to make it clear that this is the only way to minimize the risk. The, the one lesson, and there are many lessons actually from COVID. I could go into you know a long list of lessons that are applicable to climate change. But the one that really trickles to the top is risks that are high probability slash high impact, such as COVID, such as climate, have to be addressed in a timely fashion. That is the most important lesson that we can learn. And if we have not learned that and we are only, you know, going to jump out of the uh, frying pan and then into the raging fire of climate change, it just makes no sense whatsoever. So, you know, this this takes collective waking up um, and moving the collective thinking over uh, to, to that approach ASAP. We cannot afford to, you know, focus on one solution, ignoring the other crisis, and then exacerbating that crisis because we ignored it. Can we actually merge these two things, right? So that's what I call the great convergence. The great convergence of the ability that we have right now, although we're not seeing it yet, but the ability to converge the solutions between what we're doing on COVID and what we have to do on climate this is the most amazing, amazing window that we have ever had. Um, but we're not seeing it that way, right? We're still very, very short term. You have just demonstrated why the Telberg Foundation honored your leadership several years ago. Personally, I greatly appreciate everything you're doing. You just need to do much more of it much faster. Okay. All right. <laughs> Challenge accepted, Alan. Thank